Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Just Another Year Chicago. My name is Nick Roney. I am joined alongside Will Wright and a very special guest, Devin Aroma Chadu, former Chicago Bears wide receiver. Today, we are going to talk about Devin's career with the Chicago Bears, along with what we're expecting out of Justin Fields this upcoming season. But first, Devin, welcome to the show. Excited to have you on. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Absolutely. And Devin, to start off things, you know, you, during your playing days with the Chicago Bears back in 2009, you came when Jay Cutler was the Chicago Bears quarterback. And he did not like his offensive coordinators, according to audio, according to reports. And as much as, you know, fans think that everyone gets along and Cutler had to deal with a lot of offensive coordinators as a whole, you had to see that firsthand. You know, what, what, was, what was it like having Cutler just – as your quarterback, as like the gunslinger, and how often did he change plays in the huddle that actually weren't really called? Um, I like I like playing with Jay. Um, you know, he was a gunslinger, and I like that as a receiver. Somebody just gonna throw it in and wants to thread the needle, so to speak. So I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every every minute of playing with Jay. He was one of the people that definitely lobbied for me to to play. Um, and you know, um, I you know I, I enjoyed my time with him. Uh, and so in regards to, you know, having him in the huddle, what kind of person was he? Was he just like, this is what we're doing and run with it? Or did he say, I'm not calling this play. This is what we're kind of running here. I mean, he would stick to the script. You know, if he saw something, I, I think we would try to make an adjustment um, as a team. But at least when I was there, it wasn't more. We weren't running just some rogue, rogue type offense where we just weren't doing what the coaches called. Um and obviously, he's a star quarterback, so he studied the film. So, you know, you want to be able to have that autonomy to where you can kind of change something and, and be able to do that and not really have any backlash. So if he saw something, then he'd definitely take advantage of it. Absolutely. And when working with a guy, you know, like Cutler with an absolute cannon of an arm, what was the type of play that you got excited about when Cutler went into the huddle and said, this is what we're running? I mean... I love play action and I love I love running deep. My, one of my fortes is my speed and my ability to get downfield. And Cutler can has a strong arm and can get and has the ability to get the ball downfield. So for me, that was exciting anytime we were throwing it down the field. And you know, you had four touchdowns in 2009. It obviously that was a special season because you know the defense was super talented. We were that close to making it to the next level. You know, out of those four touchdowns, we were kind of talking about it before. Playing at Soldier Field can be tough, especially in the cold. Will right. won't even go to Soldier Field after Thanksgiving. He doesn't care if the tickets Thank are you. free, if he's first class or anything. Now, I know a real Will, bear I'm, thing, huh? <laughs> hey, hey, I've seen. You know what? Will's definitely gonna bring out the fur coat. You know, oh, the extra man. long, long John socks. You, but. Devin, out of your four touchdowns during that special 2009 season, which one was most memorable to you? It's hard. Uh, I mean, my my first touchdown, that was my first NFL career touchdown. And, I mean, to catch it against somebody like Charles Woodson um, at home with it with that rivalry, um, that was definitely important. Um, so, honestly, it's a tie between that one and, and the game-winning touchdown I had on Monday night. Come on now, that right. got to be it on the back. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah that, that is it. But you, you, never, Come on. you never, you never forget, you never forget your first. You know, so that was I my did. first one, and, and who and who it was against. You know, was right. also special. Somebody I, I grew up watching as well in right. his days at Michigan. So it's, it's it was hard for me to make a decision, but yeah, I guess I give the the the, the nod to to the Monday night touchdown. Ooh, um, the whole was, world was watching. They like, who this guy? The next Brandon Marshall. Let's go. <laughs> So yeah, it, was, uh, it was uh it was it was special. That was a special night for us as a team, and right. it kind of played spoiler for them. Um, I think that night because I it was a couple guys that I played with that were on the Saints. They texted me because I that meant Minnesota had to go down to uh, the road to Super Bowl for the NFC went through New Orleans, and I got like a bunch of texts from guys that played for the Saints at that time, and it ended up. I mean, I think if they would have went to Minnesota, they probably wouldn't have won there because I think they were eight and zero at home that year, and the Saints ended up winning the Super Bowl that year. So you know, it all I guess you know we we spoiled somebody's night and and helped another team get to the Super Bowl and, and win it. So there's a lot of stuff that kind of culminated from that that evening that people didn't realize. 
Did you do you happen to keep all your touchdowns or do you have at least your rook your first one? Do you have at least one of the footballs that you caught? Yeah, I keep yeah, I keep all, all my balls. I mean, that was special for me just playing being a part of the NFL. So that's something I want to remember, show my kids, and you know, just kind of remind myself. You know, you look at it and you kind of replay it in your mind. So yeah, I have all, all my balls scattered between my house and my parents' house. So love to hear. I mean, like that's, and you know, you carry that with pride and right. you know, I, I mean, I know for a fact that, you know, some of the baseballs from games that I played in championship wise, mm -hmm. yeah, I did not make it to the pros. I was mm -hmm. not cut out for it, but you know, that memory of holding it, you know, exactly where it was from. Right. It's gotta be a special feeling. And going back to, you know, I know Will says the Monday night one's the special one. And absolutely. Right. I think, as it should be. But let's go back to the Bears Packers rivalry because that was your first career touchdown right. against Charles Woodson. Obviously, very special. But, you know, we've asked a couple former Bears players as well what that preparation Lovey Smith did going into that Green Bay game. But what was it like for you as a wide receiver? You know, from an offensive perspective, what the second, you know, last Sunday's game was over, you knew it was Green Bay week. Kind of, can you run through for fans what it was like as a player prepping for that game? Well, you know, at that era and that time, it's Green Bay, you're going to get man coverage, man and two man. So, you know, you're going to have the space to, to to get open and kind of work work the defender as long as we got time to throw the ball. So, it really is far from a preparation standpoint. It wasn't, you know, it's what you want because you do one on ones every day in practice. So, you want one on one coverage. We're supposed to win in those situations. Um, and I think Green Bay was one of the teams that was saying that, you know, I think it was Donald Driver said we didn't have any receivers that year. So we kind of looked at that game as one, you know, we wanted to show that we had the ability to to play with those guys. Um, so we were definitely ready for that game. Um, I think if I remember correctly, we played them. I think it was the first game of the season that year. I was hurt. Um, so that was really I, I missed like the first half of the season due to an injury. So I was really just trying to get back going. And um that game, I think I, I found I was going to start that game, um, and I had a, I ended up having a good game. But the preparation for that one was, as a receiver, you're going to get one-on-one -on -one coverage, and you know you're going to get one-on-one -on -one coverage. So, really, we knew what we had to do, just beat, beat press man, honestly. And this is my favorite question, and I know Will likes this question too, but during that game, who was the biggest trash talker on both sides of the ball? Damn. Um, Got him well. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, I didn't know nobody stuck out to me that that, that talk trash. I mean, I I mean Aaron Rodgers, I will obviously I play offense, but Aaron Rodgers would say a lot of stuff. Um, and I would see it, but I don't know if I had anything directed at me from Green Bay that game that I can remember. Um, or anybody that I was on offense with. Oh man. I I, I you know that. We love, but who is who is your guy during 2009 that was always jawing at the other team when you guys were on offense? Um, he he didn't play offense, but I do remember a teammate of mine that would always, I mean, he always say, he always said something. Jamar Williams, he was real big, uh, oh, special team man. guy. I mean, Jamar always always had something to say. Always, if it was to us, to other team, like it didn't matter, like. Jamar always had something to say. He was definitely somebody I remember on that team, and his mouth was always open and talking. Um, so <laughs> I, I would say I would say Jamar Williams. I mean, before kickoffs, he would point at the guy that that he that he knew he had to beat or had to block him. Um, he was he was he was funny, but he was definitely someone that would not he would not be quiet. Oh man, Will, you got anything to say to that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, J you talking about Jamal Williams, the linebacker number fifty two? Yeah, whatever. linebacker, yeah, fifty two. Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to hear he was a trash talker. But yeah, I mean, he would, the whole game he would be talking. I remember one game because he was majority. He played mainly special teams, but he started. He would start some games. He was like, all he was saying on the sideline is the plate is at the table. The plate is at the table. The plate is at the right. table. So he was right. walking around the whole time saying that. So he was uh he was funny, but his energy that he brought to the team was definitely infectious, and you know it. It made us, you know, he was always positive, um, never anything dirty, but he he definitely was going to let – you know you went against Jamal Williams during the game if he, if he played. Right. Now, you, you said that um, Jay lobbied for you to play. Now, you do understand when Jay was with the Broncos, he had Brandon Williams, Eddie Royal, 
he had a bunch of big body wide receivers. So coming to Chicago, you know who the wide receivers were before you actually got a shot to go out there and showcase your talents. Man, I mean, I would I don't know what I don't I was there when he got there. Right. But who was so, I, mean, but I know I mean I was the biggest receiver, obviously. Well, so co- co- I get what you're saying. Everybody else was like shorter and faster in the sense of Knox, um, Devin. But he, he was just accustomed to having a big body receiver. Because like you said, he's a gunslinger. So he wanted right. to throw slants. He liked to throw right. back shoulders. He liked throwing right. his back foot. Like, because I was in Afghanistan, we was watching AFN. And mm-hmm. um, like I said, like the games kept us hyped up over there across the pond. Okay. So even though we didn't really have nothing to play for, you know, mm-hmm. when he hit that, because like I said, it was an entertaining game. I think it was like 36-30. Right, yeah, it was a high scoring game. It was back and forth. It was, it was, it was back and forth. Game. And when I saw Jay go back, Antoine Winfield, I said, okay, Devin got him. He, when I say he threw the he, – he, he throws one of the prettiest, like, rainbow deep passes that yeah, it, I've it, ever it, seen. It has velocity. It doesn't necessarily yes! go up. It, it goes you – know, <laughs> And, and goes, I'm talking about right in like the grand basket. A, like a jug, a, like the, uh, the, the gun that shoots the balls out. It's, right. It's, uh, so, so, so with that, okay, like like Dick said, you had four touchdowns. I'm, I'm thinking breakout. Like, what do you think was the reason that the OC at the time held you back from really just showcasing your talents? Because, like, if you look at the scout reports, like, realistically, that year, to me, you, you was number one on the depth charts with the wide receivers we had on the roster. So, I, I've always just tried to figure out why didn't he allow you to really just showcase your talents when that's not only Jay's preference because that's unlocking more of Jay's talent as well versus forcing him, you know, with smaller, right. shorter receivers that can't get that separation in tight spaces. Well, I mean, in, in that particular year, 2009, I mean, we had Ron Turner. So Ron Turner liked me. Um, I got hurt. In training, uh, the first week of practice, I got hurt. Um, so they weren't expecting me to do what I did in preseason. So they kind of had to reshuffle everything. Cause that year they drafted Johnny and Joaquin. And they already had, they just paid Devin. They had Earl, who they were trying to get going. So I was really just somebody that was just supposed to, I guess, quote, unquote, be in the mix. But, you know, everything is already preset, whether you want to believe it or not. It's already, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's already numbers. they already know what they want to do. So. I was really someone that's just supposed to be in the mix. Maybe I make it, maybe I don't. I ended up making a big impact, and um, and uh, I got hurt the first week, and I had like a like a second degree quad tear, and mm-hmm. I was just I was out for like at least three to four weeks, like not even practicing. So I kind of had to work my way back into shape, get do do, do some special teams to kind of get going, and then I finally got the opportunity to to really get out there and play. Um, and you know, that, that's really what took so much time, but really I didn't, I don't think, I don't think I really got in at receiver until like halfway through the season. Cause I was just still dealing with the injury and, you know, um, I guess just the, the course of the year, I was trying to figure out everything, them trying to figure out Jay. Cause I think that was, that was Jay's first year as well. Um, so just a lot going on, I guess maybe just stuff fell to the, fell to, or fell on the back burner. I don't, I don't know why. Um, but I did get hurt. Had I, if I didn't get hurt, I would have definitely contributed more during the during the beginning of the season. You probably would have saw what you saw earlier in the year. Okay. So I have to. So Devin, let me ask you a question because I feel like fans don't realize. I mean, none of us have ever been uh, like in the one percent of people that actually got the opportunity to be a part of an organization potentially as a player. And mm-hmm. the bears have a ton of guys that aren't going to make the roster right now. And guys are fighting right. for spots. So right. you got hurt in the, in the beginning of training camp. Can you kind of give fans a perspective of what it was like as a player in the stress mm-hmm. that you had to deal with from just an injury and how that can impact everything? Cause right. you know, you get guys on multi-year contracts making 10 million. They're on the roster. They, right. It's going to be very rare that they get right. cut. But a guy like you, I mean, you know, it was your second year in the NFL. You know, you were fighting for a roster spot as is, and then you got hurt. You lost three or four weeks, but clearly you made the roster and you did great that season. But Mm. can you kind of just run through what it's like from a personal perspective about what happens during that time and the stress that you felt? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's stressful. I mean, you definitely want to be out there out there playing. Um, I'll kind of tell you, I, 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 I'll, I'll correct you a little bit. I got hurt the first day of regular season practice. Oh, regular and, season. I'm yeah, sorry. I I'm got sorry. hurt the first day of training camp. I probably probably want they probably would have cut me. Um, honestly, I just don't I don't see any reason why, you know, they would have kept me at that point unless they had seen enough um, of what they need to see during during OTAs, which I doubt. Um, so I got hurt literally the first practice after the final roster came out. Um, and and, and uh, but had I gotten hurt during training camp, I mean, it would have been a stressful situation of me trying to figure out a way to get back on the field. I actually had that happen and I end up getting waived and had an injury injury settlement a couple a couple years prior to that. So I experienced that before. Um, it's not definitely not something you want to go through because it's not anything you can do to to earn your spot on that team. And with you trying to make the team, you don't do anything for yourself. So most likely that team's just gonna they'll look at you as a liability and let you go. Um, so you know, just that's something you go through and you just gotta move on from it. Um and just understand that as a business. I think as you get further along in the league, it's not it's not as much of it doesn't affect you as much as when you're in your first or second year. Because coming from college, you kind of look at it as like you're playing for the school and your family and whether you play or not, you'll still be there. But the NFL, if you're not contributing in some form or fashion, then your time is your days are going to be numbered. That see, like that's something that um, I always find super interesting because, you know, talking to some current players that are in their second year and sure they're on, they're on one year contracts, you know, they're not min league minimum anymore. They're making decent money. But, you know, nothing's guaranteed because unless you're a Khalil Mack type player or you're Justin Fields, you're one day you could walk on the field, sprain an ankle and you're done. And that right. changes your whole direction forever. And, you know, when I was at training camp a couple of days ago, just the stress on some of the guys that aren't named Kyler Gordon and Jaquan Brisker, the, the Bears starters that we've had. Right. And Will, I was telling you about this when I called you a couple of days ago. I mean. I feel bad for them. Like, it, yeah. and as a fan, I feel for them because, you know, uh, as a regular person, everyday person, you know, I can get fired from a job at any single moment. I can get let go or anything like that. And as a NFL, it's a job. So yeah. I've always been so curious about what's going through a player's head. Like you were saying the first couple of years, I can't imagine that stress because you guys have worked your whole life for this moment. And, you know, you made it for yourself. You had a nice, you, you had a nice career. You played in the NFL for a couple of years, but I just can't, I can't imagine what you were going through during that time. It must've been crazy. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's stressful. Um, it's stressful. I think when you, when you first go through it, you don't really realize uh, what you're going through because you come from college. So you don't realize what it is to be working. And then one day it just stops. So now you got to kind of retune yourself and, and, um, and uh, and kind of figure out what you're gonna do. But as far as like for me, I had a funny situation. So I got I got drafted to the Dolphins, and then ironically end up getting cut by the Dolphins um, at the end of training camp, and not knowing what I was gonna do. And that night, I got a call from Indianapolis, and I signed. I flew up there, signed with them, and we end up playing. That was the year they played. We played Chicago and won the Super Bowl that year. And it was in Miami. So it's like God definitely worked everything out. So regardless whether it's playing or, you know, or doing something else in life, it, it all will work itself out. So, you know, that's kind of that experience my first year. Let me know if I get cut by one team, I just got to be ready for whatever the next task or adventure is that I have that that God has planned for me. So that's kind of how I try to how I try to look at it. You know, you just experience is the best teacher. So experiencing that then when i got to chicago i really wasn't i wasn't of course I, I knew it was a possibility but i wasn't stressing that because i knew that if it happened i'll just be ready for whatever's for whatever's next so as you start to as you experience that you're not really worried about it because it's just part of it you can only keep a certain number of people you know so it, it is what it is you just move on and go to the next place and 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 you know and, and make it work because sometimes it's just it's timing. It's not necessarily your ability, but if you had the right place at the right time and, you know, you do the right things, you can you can build on that and make that team or have a successful career there. So I didn't really look at it as I as I, at first I looked at it as I failed. But after that, I looked at it as it's just it just wasn't a time or place for me at that moment. 
and it all worked out. And what was it like coming from the Colts to the Bears right after they won the Super Bowl? Was anyone in the locker room like uh, Well, yeah, I mean, if, if you've heard anything about Olin Cruz, you know he has something to say about everything. Or if you've ever known anyone that knows him, I mean, he's been a, he was a Bears center for a long time. Um, so when I came there, he was like, because uh, I didn't, I didn't play. I mean, obviously we had two, well, one technical, but two Hall of Fame receivers um, on that roster. And Brandon Stokely in the slot, um, but he was like, uh, "I don't even remember you being on that team," uh, you know. So that was that was that was his thing he had to say to me. So, but when I left there, I had his respect after I left Chicago. So, you know, that's 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 all that matters. Um, Did you ever go up to him with the ring and go, "Wait, I was on the team"? <laughs> no, nah, I didn't do that. I just got there, and Olin was the, you know, he was like the old head of the team, so I wasn't. You know, I was just new, so I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't really coming. coming. To I'm just life. messing. I, like, oh, Olin seems like a good guy. You know, I like him a lot. I love that tough guy mentality from mm -hmm. him. You, you know, Will, uh, you know, I know you got some questions too, man. Why don't you uh, fire some off for, for Devin right now? Uh, like I said, the biggest thing is that, that I look at, like you said, you, you transition to Chicago. And, again, once we saw that um, – you had the capability and the capacity to make big plays. I, I think the biggest myth was why wasn't you truly afforded the opportunity right. to do so? You know, and we're not talking about, you know, being injured. We're talking about, okay, you check the box on right. every um, intermediate route, speed, uh, physicality, um, the ability to, to get open, make mm -hmm. plays. So I, I think the biggest myth has always been why would because to me you could have had the same impact as Brandon Marshall or right. um, Alshon Asha, Jeffrey. You know, right. was was Ron Turner so focused on the run game to the point where he neglected a skill set and talent of someone that probably could have made the run game more prolific right. if he would have uh, allowed you to do so. So let me remind you of what happened then. So that year we finished that season. I had, I had a great end of the season. Um, and they fired Ron Turner. Mm -hmm. So we brought in Mike Marks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> you know, Mike Marks also <laughs> traded Greg Olson, you know, brought in, brought in his guys. And, you know, I don't know. I never really truly understood how Jay felt about him, but I mean, I know Jay's personality and I know, Mike Mark's personality, that marriage was never going to work. All in water, all in them. Right. We so, got a lot of clips of him saying some interesting stuff about Mike Martz on clips. Sorry, Devin, go right. ahead. But we know, right. we so, know. You know, with that being said, I think, because we were starting to build something there as a group. We came in, I mean, we were, the year before we were considered the worst receiving group in the NFL. You know, mm -hmm. they were talking about why Devin got, you know, got what he got at, at receiver and this and that. And, we finished the season strong. Jay started to grow in confidence. And, you know, I guess his situation where Lovey had to kind of get a new officer coordinator. When I go back and look at it, we would have, we were just growing into that offense. You know, it would have, it would have definitely benefited everyone for us mm -hmm. to stay in that office. But I get it from a stamp, from a fan perspective and probably front office is like, you know, we bring in this new quarterback. We got to get someone else that has, you know, I guess a better background or can a proven offensive coordinator, whatever, whatever, you know, opinions were. But I think the best thing for us would have been to stay in that office and allow us all to continue to grow together as a group. But when you brought in someone else who had their own ideology and they come in and basically tear down everything we built to rebuild their own thing, you know, first by getting rid of a pro bowl tight end like Olsen, um, it kind of changed stuff. And that's really the reason that I lost, you know, many opportunities in his offense. Uh, the slot receiver gets a lot of the ball. So I was the one that they wanted. He had me in the slot because he liked, I was, I, I, I knew how to play all the positions and because I had moved around to different teams and where I started at Indianapolis, I had to know everything in Indianapolis. So when I understood, when I, played when I studied the game I studied the game from a perspective of a quarterback so that's one of the reasons Jay liked playing with me because I knew the concept and not just what I had to do so 
in Mike Mars offense, the slot receiver got all the balls, which mm-hmm. in St. Louis was Ozzie King. Ozzie King, yeah. Had 100 plus catches. Mm-hmm. Yep. My, my, my body structure is not built for that. Nope. But because I was able to play inside and outside, that's where that's where he put me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and he put Devin, I think Devin and Johnny was gonna be on the outside. Mm-hmm. Um and he, or me and Earl was gonna be in, in on the inside. Um, so that didn't work out. We had a little clashing with me and him, and ultimately it was the end of my time. He basically shut me down at, at Chicago. And you know, I think the first game of the season I had like eight catches. Um, I did drop a touchdown pass that I wish I would have caught, but had like eight catches for like 90 yards. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. I finished the season with 11 catches. So I think I had seven to eight catches in the first game and I finished with like 12 catches on the year. Right. So, you know, um, that was, you know, if you can read in between the lines and you kind of, kind of figure <laughs> out, you know, what, what happened, but it just didn't, it just didn't work out. It wasn't the right fit for us. I think as a group, we were growing and he's more, he's, you know, he's got an ego. And we were a group that was just trying to, we just were trying to prove ourselves. Right. And, you know, he came in, you know, wanting to make changes and make that his offense versus just coming in and saying, how can I better put these guys in a better position to, to you know, to showcase their talents versus bringing what I got and changing everything. And, you know, like right. I said, that's started, in my opinion, with getting rid of, of Greg Olson, who was a great tight end. I don't think there's any need to get, you know, to get rid of someone like that. And we see what he went on to do um, in Carolina. Right. Well, and, 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 you, and you hit the nail on the head. Like I said, he tried to bring the greatest show on turf from St. Louis at the time to Chicago. Right. Like, realistically, right. your body type was not like Isaac King. Devin wasn't like Tory Hope. And right. Johnny wasn't like uh, Isaac Bruce. And then I think they had Brandon Monaloo as a tight end, but he was more of a black right. tight end. So right. He, so he, he brought him in because that was his guy in St. Louis. Uh, correct. Right. Correct. So, correct. And you, you didn't know, have Orlando Payton. Payton. Like, you didn't have a, a, a star-studded offensive line. So, again, you're right. And, and that's part of the reason because Jay Cutler knew it wouldn't work. I think that's the year he got sacked nine times against the Giants and got concussed in the first half. Because of Mike Mars' inability yeah. to make adjustments, study doing three, five, seven step drops when you don't have yeah. nobody to block to allow you all to get down to the field to, to go through the route tree. Right. So when the, we, you know, they're playing on turf. That's fast. We playing right. on. You seen that field? So that's not <laughs> particularly <laughs> that field to be fast or making cuts. So it's just different. It's I mean, it was you tried to bring something that you could. It just wasn't going to work. Right. Um, you know, we still end up having a good year and we're one was one game away from the Super Bowl. But, right. you know, if you imagine if we would have kept what we had, I think we easily make it to the Super Bowl. I mean, even with all the dysfunctional stuff that we had that year, we lost to Green Bay um, in the NFC Championship at home. I think, you know, if if stuff is put in place and done correctly, I think we easily – Make it to the Super Bowl every year and possibly possibly win it because Green Bay ended up winning it that year. So you know, Nick, Nick, you need to talk about the uh, the, the championship game against Green Bay because I'm still having PTSD behind that. Yep, that was so. That was my last question for you, Devin. I mm-hmm. know we're coming up on time here, but you know that game, Caleb Haney almost saved right. the day. Right, and I that's one of my favorite things. I watch that game when I'm on the treadmill all the time. The highlights and when uh-huh. everyone's like Caleb. Haney, I thought Caleb, and then everyone was like, Caleb Haney, Haney's our starter next year. Like, right. we don't need Jay anymore. But can you just, just for the fans, explain what was going on and like the energy, just the feeling of being a player on that field, and then also when Jay got hurt, can you kind of just give what it was like as a player on the field that perspective? Because a lot of people wanted Jay Cutler's head, but the right. dude was hurt. So right, can you right. just kind of give some clarity to us Bears fans? I mean, it was – we had a lot going on that week at, at practice. Um, I don't know exactly what was said. You know, Ryan went when Jay got hurt. I wasn't even over there during that during that time I was with the receivers. But, you know, it was um, – I don't know that we – I didn't have the feeling that we ever thought we were going to, to beat Green Bay. That's just my opinion. Um, it didn't yeah. feel that way. Um, and obviously watching the game, you, you know, you see how, how it went. 
I just think we weren't we weren't in the right in the right space um, when Jay got hurt, hurt for sure. Everybody thought you know that that we just we did we didn't have a chance, and some people didn't know whether he was injured or was he you know not injured. So it was a lot of that going on, and I just think we just didn't we didn't have our best game that day. Um, you know, so that's just what I think. They just played better better than us on on that day, and um, you know we can't unfortunately we couldn't get it back, but it was a uh, it was definitely demoralizing when to see the star quarterback not not be in the game. But I mean, Caleb was riding the bike. Caleb was always ready, so you know he 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 knew what to do. And I think him and him and Earl connected on a few touchdowns that game, right? I think so. Yeah, you know. two. Right. So you know, it was tough, man. Put on I, I remember Todd Collins, and I'm like, "What the hell, y'all doing? Y'all can sign me off." Yeah, <laughs> yeah wait. Now. Can you go? Can you go into that real quick, Will? I'm so happy you brought that up. What was that playing with Todd Collins? <laughs> Just, what was it like? I don't. Was that that year? Yes. That was a year with my mom. He was like he was like 42 years old. Yeah, I remember <laughs> Todd. So it. Todd is a great guy. I think. I mean, I'm gonna be honest. I don't know who made that decision, but I think Mike Mars had the ability to bring in guys that he wanted there, um, and that would because his offense is very difficult to to learn, especially for a quarterback. It's complex. So if you have someone like that that's a veteran, then he's probably looking at it like, okay, if if Jay goes down, Todd would be my guy for the long haul. Like, let's say Jay went down halfway through the season. I don't know when this actually happened, but Todd would be a guy that at least knows the plays versus a younger guy that's not played like Caleb Haney because there's a stigmatism with people that haven't played in games versus bringing in someone old. Like, my rookie year in Indianapolis, I'm going to make you guys laugh. Instead of playing, Instead of playing me, we signed Ricky Pro. I said, I play. I said I, I played with Ricky Paul on Tecmo Bowl. Who? Ricky <laughs> yeah. Ricky Paul played for the Rams. I think he was drafted in 1989. Ricky Pro was commentating my last preseason game when we we played the Dolphins played the Rams my rookie season. And when he came to the Colts, he's like, I remember you. I commentated your last your last game in preseason game. So. Rather than rather than give me opportunity to play as a as a rookie, they went out and signed Ricky Paul Pro from commentating and whatever he was doing, you know, because they just guys just I, I guess it's just a you know stigmatism with people that haven't played versus signing somebody that at least you know they'll go out there and just put the jersey on and you know you know and kind of hey he he done he did something before so that's better than than let someone else play but yeah this. I mean that's that's very common. I don't know how much it happens now in the game, but yeah, Ricky, I played Ricky Pearl, and I was like, I re, I played with you on Tecmo Ball, and now you're my team. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, and, and, and you got you got to understand, like, un- unfortunately, in the city of Chicago, when you think about okay, uh, the comment has been made, Chicago is the city where wide receivers go to die, and a lot mm-hmm. of that is attributed to the fact I would say the last hell. 20 years, we probably had 35, 40 different quarterbacks. Right. And out of that, realistically, I would say three or four would have been reputable, mm-hmm. you know, to, to really give you a solid chance to be competitive on Sunday. So, you know, as we transition uh, moving forward to what we currently got in house, right? And I know you've been watching him, JF1, him, Devin. Do you, my question is, because I know Nick got a question as well. But do you do you think we finally? Because I, honestly, I thought Jay was gonna be our guy. Right. That happened in Afghanistan. I was sleeping, woke up watching Armed Forces Network, ESPN, da da da, news breaking. Chicago's made this big trade. Kyle Orton. Right. I said, yeah, man, I'm sleeping, man. Yeah. I, I thought I was dreaming. I went back to sleep and waited until I got up the next morning. So do we finally have our guy, Devin? Like seriously, I'm talking about so our I, guy. I, so I, I answer this. You had your guy in Jay Cutler. I think Jay had a good career in Chicago, regardless of what anyone says. He was one of the best quarterbacks I've seen there in, you know, in this uh in the last, I would say what, two, two decades, you know, from the 2000 to where we are now. Um Justin, I think they I think he I think he is the guy. Just gotta they just gotta be you have to be patient with quarterbacks. It's a tough position. He's playing in one of the toughest environments with some of the toughest fans. Um, 
So they just got to give him opportunities. He's got to know. One thing about Jay, he didn't care what people said. I don't know. I don't know Justin's mentality, but you have to have that type of mentality. You have to be like a cornerback, not care if you get beat and be ready to go back out there the next play and not worry about what the fans are going to say about you because you're going to you're going to make mistakes. So just learn from those and, and continue to develop. But it's a tough place to play. He's not going to go out there. He's not playing in L.A. or Miami or in a dome somewhere. It's a tough environment and it gets cold. And, you know, it's a I mean, that field is, is terrible. Um, I don't know if they if they fixed it since I left, but it wasn't wasn't no. great. <laughs> I mean, you have a concert there the night before we play. So, um, you know, um, I think he'll be fine. I think he's a guy everybody just has to rally behind him and, you know, and 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 um, and him just have a string of good games. The next thing you know, he's rolling it and building that confidence um, that he needs. But I think I've watched him in, quarter, in uh, college. Um, so I, I follow his career when he was at Georgia, when he was at Ohio State. So he's a good quarterback. Um if something happens, it would just be that it didn't work out or, you know, his confidence was it was up and down with the mistakes. But I think – I don't think you guys got something. I don't think there's nothing better for this team. You don't want to start over. Um, and it's, it's hard to bring somebody else in from somewhere else. They're coming from another environment. So I just think, you know, I think that's I think that's the guy. Okay. Love to hear that. That's what we want to hear, Will. Absolutely. He's the guy. I think, and that's the thing is that everyone has said he is the guy, you know, Jason McKee said it, you know, right. you said it, Joaquin mm-hmm. said it, uh, Will, you know, J- Justin Fields is the guy and we're excited for him and we're happy to see that. And that's the thing is that former alumni who have had success with the Chicago bears have seen success with Jay Cutler. That's what we're hoping to see again with Justin Fields. So Will, do you have any more questions before we uh, close out today? Oh, I was going to ask Devin, you plan on going in the game with me this year? Hey. Let me know. Let me know. I I haven't. I'm gonna be honest. I haven't been to a game since I played there. So you okay. know, I'm, I'm, gonna, be, I'm gonna be honest because you you just hit the nail on the head. Because I followed Justin from he from Kennesaw, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Went yep. to Georgia. Yep. Lost to Jake from, but yep. not because of talent, but because of pressure from the the boosters. Mm-hmm. Like people don't understand it. That's why Justin left Georgia, then went to Ohio State. And then again, in Ohio State, he had an all-star cast, a trio of receivers, right. Alove, Alave, right. uh Jameson Winston, Williams. Um, yeah, Gary, got, Will, yeah, yeah, he had a yeah, he had a good group, you know. He had a good group. Um, different then, league. Went to went to the, the Nagy, like Nagy changed his whole how he had have his front foot. Like people don't understand when you change someone's mechanic that's been doing this for 20 plus years. Right, and then now right. he got Luke Gessie coming in from Green Bay last year, installing a totally different system. Now he got to yeah. change to this foot. Like people don't understand, and so that's why I laugh when I see, especially on social media, when people say, "Oh, y'all got a running back." And last year, Devin, me, you, and Nick could have suited up for the Bears last year, and they they gave out about 25, 31 year co- because Ryan Poe's new coming in, he was gonna tear this thing down from to the studs. Mm-hmm. So he had absolutely no supporting cast last year. And the supporting cast they had, they traded after like week four or five. Well, I'm sorry, after that um, New England game, which was probably like week six or seven. So you got Justice out there with a bunch of scrubs at the end of the day, and he still finished in like a five, six-year week period top four quarterback. Because I had him in fantasy football. When I tell you he made me a lot of money, oh, my God. That boy shine bright like a diamond. <laughs> so now, when you look at what he got, like if, if the line stay healthy, that's the key. Right. DJ Moore's gonna gonna eat. Chase Claypool in training camp right now, he eating because y'all got y'all got sort of a similar bill. Um, and then Darnell Mooney, he eating. So you got three potential one thousand yard receivers right there. Got mm-hmm. two tight ends and Tanya and Cole Komet. That's gonna eat over the middle. Got some good serviceable running backs that's gonna eat. Like the sky's the limit. He got the right offense. He got the right whole game plan structure. Like, like you said earlier, like people don't look at the big picture of what it takes to be successful as a quarterback. Right. You know, you, it's, it's a lot of different elements that have to be in play in order for you to excel. And let's be honest, last year 
He did, like you would have thrived in that system because the people he was throwing to, Economy St. Brown, Dante Pattis, man, they couldn't catch a cold, buck naked in the North Pole. And, and what they caught a lot of time was more so by accident than by design. Because like when you run a route tree, like on a comeback, we were taught to come back to the ball. Mm-hmm. Like Equinome and Say Brown, if you watch him, he, he like his route running is so stiff, it allows the cornerback to jump in front of him. So on a right. timing route where you anticipate your wide receiver to be where he needs to be, a lot of times those are interceptions because one, he doesn't allow his body to be a shield, and two, when he's not coming back, when he, he's breaking down to come back, somebody like Jari Alexander, who is a ball hawk, mm-hmm. is, is cutting right in front of him and, and getting unnecessary interceptions. So when you're a quarterback and you're you're trying to allow your, your wide receivers to make plays, but really they're throwing you out there and, 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 and throwing you under the bus, like I can see when your confidence and mental start to waver. Right. But – I think now, though, he got the pieces in play to be successful. What you think? Well, if he has that, consistency is key. So yeah. as a quarterback, when you can – I mean, everybody sees what – saw what uh, Tom Brady and Bill Belichick did. Mm-hmm. Same system, same stuff. Mm-hmm. Plugging in people. Not, they didn't change anything. They didn't try to reinvent anything. They kept everything the same. So as a quarter – as anybody doing something in your profession, the more you do it over and over – the more, you know, it becomes second nature and you're able to do it faster. So the the moving parts and the changing of coaches and coordinators, that's not going to help Justin Fields. Right. If he can stay somewhere and stabilize and learn something now, he's not coming in beginning of the season trying to learn a whole playbook or learn, you know, new receivers. He's just coming in moving fast because the same thing he was doing last year. So the longer he gets to do that, the better off I think he is. And now he's just playing football versus thinking. Um, and now it just becomes it's, it's natural and second nature to him. So I think that'll help overall if you can just get in the situation to where it's just, look, you're our guy and this is what we're going to run and this is how we're going to do it. We're going to play to your strengths and, and that's it versus worried about, you know, bringing in someone else or not worried whether you're going to be the guy the next year. I think that stuff can affect someone. So, uh, you know, dealing with that, I think if he can – just find that that stable ground. I think I think he'll be all right. You know, I think everything will work out. But that definitely plays a part because I don't know any quarterback that's had multiple offensive coordinators that continue to play at a high level. It's just hard to do because you got to know so much, and everybody likes their stuff this way or that way. And now you got to relearn everything. And sometimes as receivers, we forget to play. So or anybody else, who do you think we go ask? We go ask the quarterback. So he has – if he doesn't know, you know, he's got to know everything. So it's a, it's a lot on somebody's plate to learn every other year or every year, you know, and it, it, it can weigh on them. So they can't – you can't play fast. Right. So, Nick, when you go to training camp and you see the Dan Witterers and all those guys from Chicago that's reporting, hmm. the insight that, that – and see, this, huh? this is why, honestly, I hate to say it. Well, I don't hate to say it, but sports media is, is better – when you get actual insight from someone that played at that level versus somebody that's a book one that's sitting up here like, oh, the offense was ridiculously bad today because you don't even know that they're going through plays in training camp to see what works versus what don't work. Right. So if Justin yeah. throws an or interception in training camp to, to on a play that uh, might be a two-minute drive in a game, guess what? In training camp, that's, that's where you work these kinks out right. to say that this won't work. Right. In a two-minute drive, you don't turn around and report to the, the to the masses and say, "Oh, the offense was a clunker," and you know Justin looks bad. Like, like it, to me, it's like people be waiting to mm-hmm. see Justin um, go through periods of being inadequate or or or, or throwing interceptions or not mm-hmm. hitting the back out the like. You work on that in training prep. You work on that in preseason. So right. that you'll know either, okay, this play will work in this situation or it won't. We're going to scrap it. So right. Right. big picture, like, you need to understand th- these games don't count. Like right. you said, he's in a system now for the second season in a row, but he's got a whole bunch of new personnel because he really didn't play with Claypool. He, he's never played with uh, DJ Moore. He got a right. bunch of new offensive linemen. He got a new tight end in Tanya. He got several new running backs in um, – uh, Foreman, Deontay Foreman, and Rashawn Johnson. Mm-hmm. So 
I want people to, especially media, because like the, the Colin Coward, like they put so much bad um, sports jargon out there that right. really at this point is pushing like us that know better what right looks like away because a lot of that stuff to me is starting to be like clickbait versus good journalism or sports media to right. get us yeah. all enticed and excited about what's getting ready to happen in right. the 2023 it's, 2024 And it's, it's happening. It's unfortunately happening a lot, but yes. at the same time, there are a lot of good reporters. You know, you got you got Braggs that's there every day. He's doing a great job reporting. You got the Windy City Productions there a lot. So, you know, it is changing, and the offense and it, this team is a lot more exciting. And it's finally starting to get some media, national media recognition. You know, I've retweeted a couple stuff, Will, and you've you've texted me about it. But it's all is looking good for the Chicago Bears, and you know, Devin. I think that you do need to come back up to Chicago. We do have some stuff. We have our viewing party October 1st against the Broncos that Will is coming up for as of right now. So would love for you to join for that. And then we have our big tailgate uh, week seven, October 22nd against the Raiders. So sure. would love for you to come back to Chicago. Love for you to sure. join us, you know, in person would be a lot of fun, but you know, I know we're a little over time here, so I want to thank you for coming on and thank no everybody problem. for Thanks tuning for in to this episode. But yeah, man, thanks for coming on. Seriously, it was a lot of fun. And, and, and Nick, give give Devin a shout out. Devin, tell Nick what you're doing right now. Cause look, you still operate yeah. at a high level. Yeah. yeah so what are you up you to know, these days? Devin? I'm out here. Uh, I'm a mortgage banker. Um, I've been doing that for I think seven years now. Uh, work with a company called Movement Mortgage, and uh, do all everything every, all, everything with residential loans. So um, that's that's what I'm doing now. Grind never stops, man. You're on and off the field, man. Grind never stops, huh? No, never, never, never can't stop. Can't stop. Not, not in this world. Not for me. I'm too competitive. So I got to be doing something to where I can, I can, I can, you know, I can, I can see what I've co completed over, over the course of a year and things like that. So for me, I, I love it. And I might be needing your help in a little bit here because I'm looking to get a house in the next uh, year or two. So I'll be calling Perfect. you, Devin, for I got my license in Illinois. So we can yeah, he likes in Illinois. So yeah. hey, now you got to come back and find me a house. <laughs> 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 there we go. But Devin, thanks for coming on, man. Seriously appreciate it. It's always great chopping it up with former Bears, and hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Thank you. Absolutely. And Will, as always, thanks for tuning coming on, man. I'm sure I'll be calling you after, but. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into this episode of Just Another Year Chicago with Devin and Robert Shadu and Will Wright. We had a ton of fun with you guys. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, put your thoughts in the comment section below, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you and bear it out.